Hi everyone, I thought we'd take a quick break from Nimzovich and Theory in order to continue a series started some time ago, Magnus Watch. Fam fans of Nimzovich need not worry as we will return to him in due course. Magnus Carlsen is now officially the highest rated player in the history of chess with a rating of 2861, 10 points ahead of Kasparov at his peak and 50 points clear of Kramnik, who is currently the second highest rated player in the world. There is no doubt that we are witnessing history in the making. The Weekend Z tournament is just around the corner which will surely grasp the attention of chess lovers worldwide and in March we will have the Candidates tournament to decide who will play Anand for the title later in the year. Thus an exciting year lies ahead. Also in the candidates tournament is Swidler, Kramnik, Rajabov, Ivanchuk, Aronian, Gelfand and Grishuk. So for the continuation of this series I thought we would have a look at how Carlsen has fared against these players in the past. The game I chose for this video was played at the Amber Chess Tournament in Monte Carlo in 2010. It was a blindfold game and Carlsen had the black pieces against Swidler who opened with e4. We just uh, flip this so we can see it from Carlsen's perspective. He responded with c5 which is the Sicilian defense and it's an opening that he employs fairly regularly against uh, 1e4 although he's renowned for playing a wide range of openings which makes him hard to prepare to play you know, in match format or even just for a single game in a tournament. It's one of his many strengths. Play continued with one of the many book lines, knight f3 and d6, point of this move or the threat of this move is to play e5 to create a bind on the d4 square so generally speaking white will play d4 to prevent that so this is obviously all still long established uh, as best play and we saw the standard continuation c takes d4 knight takes d4 now knight f6 attacking the e4 pawn and now knight c3 defending it and here Carlson played g6 which is the dragon variation so called because the king side pawns here resemble the constellation Draco which is the dragon. Carlson is one of the few top grandmasters who is still willing to play this opening although he's not done so since uh, 2010. Svidler continued with bishop e2 which is going into the classical dragon as opposed to the sharper Yugoslav attack lines with the bishop c4 instead of e2. And here Carlsen continued development with bishop g7. Obviously this is going to be played so nothing better to do at the moment, may as well play it. And now uh, both sides castle short and of course White's sharpest response to the Sicilian is to castle long and pawn storm but uh, Svidler chose to avoid such a scenario. It's probably a good idea when you're playing against Carlsen. So play continued bishop e3 and one of the advantages of playing bishop e2 instead of bishop c4 is that you can play bishop e3 preparing to challenge the fian shadow bishop here with something like queen d2 you don't have to worry about knight g4 which would be possible if the bishop was on uh, c4 and here Carlson played knight c6 which creates some pressure on the, the d4 knight in conjunction with the latent pressure from the bishop here on g7 and uh, Svidler was compelled to deal with this pressure right away answering with knight b3 and you know we're still well within theory at this point so uh, next game a6 from Carlson preventing White from using b5 for his pieces which he may like to do and uh, also preparing queenside expansion with b5 and so on. One of the drawbacks of the dragon is that with the bishop here on g7 it's a lot more weakening than normal for black to push in the center with e6 or e5 because this d6 pawn uh, is 
a lot weaker because the bishop is on g7 it would usually be on e7 where it can defend um, so usually black won't push with a z pawn in the center in uh, the dragon setups uh, so Svidler now press forward on a king side with f4 and he's hoping to play e5 uh, at the right moment, you know, with due preparation, which will give Black some problems to solve, like where is he going to put this knight, and how will he deal with knight d5, etc. After that, and uh, we now see some similar ideas to positions that have already been covered in the series on Nimzovich, with both sides fighting for control of an important central square, e5 in this case, with White trying to push and kick the knight and black trying to prevent white from pushing and Carlson is playing provocatively here and provoking this f4 has weakened the e4 pawn and uh, the e4 square so if he can try and exploit that then he's uh, done well and he can do this immediately with b5 which is what Carlson played, you know, threatening b4 and then simply knight takes e4. So we have play on both sides of the board in uh, standard Sicilian style. So Svidler, of course, has seen this idea and he defended the threat with bishop f3, which takes aim at this loose knight here on c6 and eyes the rook on uh, a8. And Carlson dealt with that immediately with bishop b7. The drawback of this is that it allows the e5 push immediately because the bishop is loose here on uh, b7 and so black is oh sorry white is able to gain good space after d takes e5 f takes e5 and knight d7 and of course not knight takes e5 bishop takes b7 and you know like i said black has been playing provocatively and Svidler has gladly accepted the bait he has gained space, but it comes at the cost of weak squares after uh, knight d7. As, as long as he retains control of the position, it shouldn't be a problem. But he's now faced with the question of how to defend the uh, e5 pawn. And in actual fact, it can't be done because it's attacked three times and it's undefended. And uh, the only other option is advancing it, which he did. but you know the point is that after e6 um, it's, strictly speaking it is a pawn sack but black would have to be crazy to try and hold on to the material because after f takes e6 comes bishop g4 and uh, this is going to win back the pawn or it's going to force black into a very passive position um, obviously he can't push e5 here he's dropping a piece on uh, d7 e5 in fact queen d5 check is the strongest move and now to king h8 now bishop takes d7 and obviously it's winning for white um, so after bishop g4 Carlson played rook takes f1 which is the best move and after queen takes f1 he played knight c e5 which interestingly uh, Fritz wasn't so keen on uh, preferring instead knight f8 which I'll show you in a second um, and it's interesting really because it's you know the difference between a materialistic computer and a positional genius because I mean Carlson quite simply has played to weaken the e-file and then plant a piece on e5 you can see all his his pieces are directed at it and supporting it so therefore knight c5 unleashing the bishop as well you know is what his strategy has revolved around and Fritz gives you know a tiny edge, well about half a pawn to to white here um, which means that black has uh, not you know a slightly inferior position because uh, he's a pawn up and yeah white is ahead on the evaluation so what Fritz preferred was knight f8 uh, giving the position as equal and this you know maintains the pawn 
but like I said it's very passive and white would have good compensation after for example rook d1 attacking the queen queen c7 and now knight c5 and uh, yeah I mean there's pressure immediately again on e6 with the knight and the bishop knight takes b7 is a threat and uh, all kinds of other stuff black is getting very active oh sorry white is getting very active and black is getting very passive so knight c e5 is what Carlson played anyway okay that's the end of part one